Well, first I want to say thank you for having me. Uh, I, I am so proud of my brother and Christine for starting this organization. Uh, it's pretty incredible when you see these faces who, who are the real people who are stroke survivors and the people who love them. So that's, uh, that's my brother, and that's me, and that's all of you. And you know, it's, it's one thing to read about it. You know, I, I have a doctorate, and I read a lot of studies, and I write a lot. But it's such a different experience to actually you know, meet somebody, talk to people, see your faces. So I, I, I'm just really honored to, to be here. And uh, you know, I, I have to say it's also really incredible uh, to, to hear my brother. Isn't he a great speaker? Yeah. Yeah. Isn't it amazing that when he had a stroke that he couldn't say one word? And I'm sure, raise your hand if you can relate to that. Yeah. Raise your hand if you felt frustrated by that. Yeah. Raise your hand if you felt depressed by that. So it's incredible, and I think what my brother's journey shows is the power of working hard, working every single day of your life to recover. So what I want to talk about today is about the psychology and also the lifestyle changes, which are really important. Uh, I, I want to begin by reading something. Um, I don't. Hey, Mom, have you talked about this book? Just a little bit. Just a little bit, okay. Um, so, this mm -hmm. mic doesn't like me. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm really proud that I co-wrote a book um, called Healing the Broken Brain uh, with my brother David and Megan. And we interviewed all of the leading experts in stroke uh, around the country. Uh, I guess I'm just going to hold this. Uh, in various fields. Is that better? Yeah. Uh, so here's the cover. Uh, and uh, it's going to be um, out May 2nd. Uh, but I want to give you all a sneak preview and talk about some of the, my, some of the things that really struck me from this book. Um, there's just so much to know when it comes to stroke, isn't there? I, I don't know of a disease uh, that affects who you are, right? It's the, uh, thank you. It's, uh, you know, when it, all disease is terrible, but when somebody has a heart attack, they're still themselves in a lot of ways. You know, he, he may be weak. You know, my dad had a few heart attacks, and he was very weak. Uh, and he was a tired, and maybe a little depressed version of himself, but he still knew how to, he still knew how to speak, right? So stroke is so different because the brain it affects who we are. It affects what we do. Everything that we do, from how I move my hand to what I decide to eat for lunch, it all comes from the brain. So we're going to talk about a lot of things today, but I want to begin. by talking about a concept called neuroplasticity. Let's write that word down, neuroplasticity. How many of you know what neuroplasticity is? How many of you know that by being here, you are doing something to increase neuroplasticity, right? Neuroplasticity is the birth of new brain cells. It's the birth of new connections in the brain. And it's important for everybody but it's really, really important for people who've had a stroke. My brother likes to travel a lot, and in the studies, there's a really fancy clinical term called an enriched environment. Megan, you see this word a lot, right? Uh, if there's any professionals, how many, of you, how many of you have heard this word, enriched environment? So in studies, they, they use animal studies a lot for this, right? So they have, let's say they have a rat in a cage, and they don't give that rat anything. And that rat just sits there. And then over here, you have some rats in a cage, and they get a wheel, 
and they get some nesting material that they can move around. Maybe they get a maze, and they can you know, figure out how to get through that maze. And those rats, that's an enriched environment. We're all, right now, in an enriched environment because we are challenging our brains. When you do something new, when you do something that scares you, when you have a conversation with somebody here at Aphasia Recovery Connection, you are taking part in actively deciding to be part of an enriched environment, which leads to neuroplasticity. My brother likes to travel a lot, and there's a study on taxi drivers in London. How many of you use Google Maps or some sort of app on your phone? How many of you remember when there were no apps? <laughs> Before Uber, taxi drivers used to have to memorize cities. And there is a study on taxi drivers, and because they didn't rely on these apps, and they had to create this mental map of every street in a huge city like London or New York. And they had to know every alley. They scanned their brains and they realized that their brains were bigger. That by learning that, that they had increased the neuroplasticity. Well, I don't want any of you to have to memorize a city map, but it would be great if you did. Or you could just go to a new city or you could come to Las Vegas and you could figure out how to get here, a place you've never been. And you could walk around a casino and, and you could f meet new people, right? So there are just so many simple ways in which we can uh, really figure out how to increase our neuroplasticity. I, I, I want to read one of my favorite quotes that's in this book. Therapy doesn't happen just in a room with a professional but every day out in the world. Let me read that again. Therapy doesn't happen just in a room with a professional, but every day out in the world. Isn't that incredible? How many of you, when you first had your stroke, heard these words like speech therapy, occupational therapy? And how many of you had an idea that, oh, if I just went to this room, this professional, Megan, she's a world-renowned speech and language pathologist. If I just go to her in our speech therapy, she'll fix me. How many of you had an idea like that? That therapy was this so-so, so yes, or some version of that, maybe it wasn't that strong, right? So we have this idea that therapy is this clinical, formal, in a room, with somebody with some license and advanced degree, and I'm one of those people, and Megan is one of those people, and it's great. It's great. You should do it. But at some point along the way, you will also learn that therapy doesn't just happen in a room with a professional. How many of you have learned that lesson? That life becomes therapy. Isn't that sort of beautiful? with insurance companies not paying for very much these days, <laughs> right? You should fight for as much therapy as you can get. But we also need to realize that everything we do in our lives is therapy. And that is especially true when you've had a stroke. Where are my stroke survivors here? Raise your hand. Where are my loved ones of stroke survivors? Raise your hand. It's just incredible, isn't it, to, to sit here and, and, and maybe have some optimism, right? Maybe have some joy uh, to realize that there are our answers. Uh, there, there are so many things I want to talk about today, and I brought some visuals. Um, but let's talk about neurogenesis, and I, I want to reveal a miracle treatment. It is truly a miracle. So going back to that word neurogenesis, the birth of new brain cells. There is a miraculous new treatment, and it's truly incredible in terms of what it does in the brain, in terms of boosting what is essentially, I would call it, 
your own stem cells, right? You've all heard of stem cell therapy. Well, there's a way to manufacture what's called BDNF in the brain, and there's one miraculous way to do it. And it's to put these on, right? Exercise. We know that exercise is probably the best way to stimulate the birth of new brain cells. How many of my stroke survivors have difficulty exercising now? What do you do? Christine, what do you, what do, you do? Um, I walk, and um, I tried a personal trainer. Uh -huh. And did that personal trainer help you to find things that you could do? Yeah. yeah. Who else? Oh, sorry, thank you. <laughs> Who else who's had difficulty exercising now found something that they can't do? Thanks. Anyone here? How, how, many, how many of my stroke survivors find it hard? It's difficult, right? So it's interesting that when you've had a stroke, and if you have any paralysis, you are essentially moving less, and you're also, therefore, burning less calories. So you probably need to exercise more, but then you're in the situation where it's hard to exercise because you can't just, many of you can't just go to the things you used to go to. You need, maybe you need a special accommodation. And this is where the psychology of recovery comes in. So what I do in, uh, I'm a cognitive behavioral therapist, and I treat mostly mood disorders like depression, anxiety. And one of the things that I do is I help people to focus on what they can do and not what they can't do. And it's hard when you walk into a gym, let me say that again, you, you focus on what you can do, not what you can't do. When we do this, we know that there is a sense of optimism, that there is a sense of hope. We know in research that there is one emotion that is the most dangerous, that's the most toxic, that I worry about the most if I'm treating somebody and they say that they have this feeling. And it's, does anyone have any guess what that, what that emotion is, which is the most toxic emotion, the one that I worry about if I'm treating somebody? Anyone have any guesses? Fear. Fear. What else? Any other guesses? Failure. Failure. Fear of failure. Anything else? Hopelessness. Hopelessness. That's it. What is it? Hopelessness. Hopelessness. I, I can work with fear. I can work with depression. I can work with sadness, but hopelessness, that's, that's a tough one. Because what does hopelessness mean? Because hopelessness, fear, and depression are related to hopelessness. How many of you have felt hopeless after your stroke? And what did you do? Mm -hmm. You got a dog. Dogs are great medicine. How many of you have pets at home? Aren't dogs amazing? Aren't animals just amazing? Did your dog help you to discover hope again? Yes. How? Because uh, I had to exercise and I had to make sure it was clean and feet, you know. He forced you into it, huh? Yeah. He forced you into exercising and to doing something. Even when you didn't want to walk, he had to walk, didn't he? Yeah. And, and, and we know that you just revealed the behavioral part of cognitive behavioral therapy. So one way that you can banish hopelessness and sadness is when you notice, I call them pitfall thought patterns. Pitfall thought patterns are the types of thoughts that, in research, we know that people with depression and anxiety use. 
So uh, I use different terms for them because I like to create little fun games for myself. So I, I created seven that I'll start with the letter P. Uh, I want to talk about some of the ones that I think are the most relevant to survivors and the people who love them. I think the worst, perhaps, is permanence. I think the second worst is maybe uh, pessimism. And the third is what I call paralysis analysis. So I want to define these three pitfall thought patterns and then tell you what to do about them. So permanence is that feeling, and tell me if you can relate to this, that when you're sad or you're hopeless or you're fearful or you're depressed, that it feels like you're always going to feel this way. How many of you have had that feeling? And how many of you know that that is no longer true? Raise your hand if you know that you've gotten through that. So anybody who still feels that way, look around and, and see that people who maybe used to feel this, think this way, this, it's always going to be this way, that that is not true. That these people have maybe felt this way, but that was not true. When we feel permanence, what happens in the brain is mood congruent recall uh, lights up all of the similarly charged memories. So if you're feeling sad right now, your brain will light up all of the sad memories that you've ever had in your whole life. And if we, in research, if we ask you to recall a sad memory and we measure how quickly you can do that, sad memories come up like this. Tell me about your sad memories. And you, you can recall them like this because they're lit up in the brain. And if you're feeling sad and I say, tell me about a happy time, there's a pause. Because all of the happy memories in your brain have gone dim. And that phenomenon makes it feel like you're sad now. And my life has always been sad. And if that's true, then my life will always be sad. Does that make sense? We need to remember that that is an illusion that is caused by mood congruent recall in the brain. And one of the ways that you can banish permanence, and it may take you a second, because remember in, this, in research studies it, it takes a, a little bit of time, but it's to ask yourself, what is the contrary evidence? And think about that. What evidence do I have in my life? When was a time that I felt sad and I felt like I was always going to be sad and that wasn't true, right? It's funny when, when I think about my brother's story and what we went through as a family and there was a time when if I really think about it, I'm pretty sure I used to feel that way. But to be honest, I haven't thought about that. It's like something I don't even think about anymore, 20 years later. And for me, there was a time when I felt that way, and now it's no longer true and I don't think about it, right? So I, I think we all have examples of that. So uh, one of the other pitfall thought patterns, um, paralysis analysis, uh, one of the behavioral ways of cognitive behavioral therapy is Paralysis analysis is rumination. It's stewing in thoughts. My mom does this a lot because she's very anxious. Right, mom? <laughs> and I have her genes, so I'm very anxious, right? People who are anxious, we tend to think about the what ifs. We tend to think of the what could go wrong. We have a little joke in my family when I come home for Christmas that if it's a Saturday afternoon, and I need to be at the airport at five. My mom says, oh gosh, we should probably allow three hours to get to the airport. What if there's traffic? <laughs> right, but that's an, an example of, of looking for, using that, that what if thinking, looking for, you know, uh, using this anxious style of thinking. And, and when, 
when we notice that, how many of you have felt paralysis analysis uh, where you're ruminating and, and you're thinking and you're worrying and you can't stop? Has anyone felt that way? Yeah, you in the back? I do. <laughs> anyone else? Anyone else use that stewing and you think about what's wrong and you just keep thinking about it and thinking about it? and thinking about it, that's paralysis analysis. So what we know is the solution in cognitive behavioral therapy is the behavioral part, which is to just do something. You do something that's either pleasurable or you do something that's productive. So for you, when you were probably, I imagine when you had your dog, uh, are you a survivor or a loved one? Mm -hmm. yeah. You're a survivor. I imagine that after your stroke, you worried a lot. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think we can all relate to that. But your dog forced you to do something pleasurable because you had to walk in it, right? Yeah. And, and that interrupts the circuitry in the brain, that spinning, right? It, it gets us out. So if you feel that way, just do something. You can. Do something pleasurable, like walking your dog, taking a bath, calling a friend, seeing a movie. Or you could do something productive. You could wash the dishes. You could clean your room. You could go pick up your prescription. You just do something. It tends to interrupt that. And, and, and we know that this is a clinically valid treatment for depression. And a lot of people who are survivors and loved ones experience depression. So isn't it great that there, there are remedies, that there are ways um, to really interrupt that? I, I want to read something that's really meaningful to me. And uh, this is from the Army. When my brother was in the hospital, his, and he was 10 years old, his doctor gave him a watch that had, it was like a G.I. Joe, a soldier on it. And she explained to him, I think the story is probably here. I'll just read the story, how about that? On his last night in the hospital, David got a watch from his doctor with a soldier on it. It was a reminder for him to fight. Stroke survivors are indeed warriors. So this is the US Army's Warrior in Transition Mission Statement. And I wanna read it here. I will always place the mission first. I will never accept defeat. I will never quit. I will never leave a fallen comrade. I am a warrior in transition. My job is to heal as I transition back to duty or continue serving the nation as a veteran in my community. This is not a status, but a mission. I will succeed in this mission because I am a warrior and I am army strong. Kind of inspiring, isn't it? That these soldiers realize that they are still warriors, but they're warriors in transition. So I adapted this, and this is what I call the stroke warriors creed, right? I will always place the recovery mission first. I will never accept defeat. I will never quit. I will never leave a fallen survivor. I am a stroke warrior in transition. My job is to heal, or if I'm a loved one, to help my survivor, my loved one heal. My job is to heal as I transition back to my previous role, or continue serving my community and family in a new way. This is not a status, but a mission. I will succeed in this mission because, and then I have a blank line in the book. What, what, how do you finish that sentence? I will succeed in this mission because, what's your why? Anything pop into anyone's mind? I'm a fighter. Because I'm a fighter. That's right, because you're gonna fight, right? I will succeed in this mission because I'm a fighter. Anyone else have something that pops in your mind? I will succeed in this mission because, because you're a warrior. Yeah. You're a fighter. You're a warrior. 
So think about what your why is, right? Whether you write it down or you think about it tonight, I will succeed in this mission because in psychology, we know that when you identify your why, right? That's what this question is asking you to do. When you identify your why, why are you doing this? What makes you get out of bed when you don't want to? What makes you show up here when you kind of just want to sit and watch TV all day? What makes you go to therapy and go to your doctor's appointments or help your loved one or make the commitment to be here or make the commitment to do something new every day? What is your why? When we identify our why, something that's important to you personally, maybe for me, when, when I read this, I, you know, as a family member, I will succeed in this mission because I love my brother and my family and I want to see him happy, you know? And when we identify with that and it means something to us, man, that is the best fuel, right, that keeps us going. Because this, as my mom always said, it's not a, what do you always say, mom? It's not a sprint, it's a marathon, right? No, no, that's not your quote. You always say there's no stop sign. Oh, there's no stop sign. <laughs> There's no stop sign in the road to recovery, right? It's all go, it's all green light. You gotta go, and you gotta go, and you gotta go, and you gotta keep going, and keep going. And when you identify with what your why is, well that goes a long way with filling your gas tank with the fuel that you will need to get through this mission. There's another just beautiful quote from one of the doctors we interviewed. Uh, and, and it's so poetic, and uh, this is from Dr. Carmichael, and he says, in the treatment of brain injury, the story starts out slowly. The patient is a shadow, damaged, frightened, and withdrawn. But as physicians, therapists, and family connect, hope grows anew, recovery begins, and pages turn. And it is an appreciation of the simplest parts of ourselves, something simpler than we could ever believe, that begins personal recovery on the neurorehabilitation unit. When we can make these shadows dance, that is the art of brain repair. I love that last sentence. When we can make these shadows dance, that is the art of brain repair. The funny thing is I, I relate to that because I don't believe that brain repair is strictly a science. I think it's also an art. And I believe that because we have to identify the spiritual, the, um, the personal reasons of, of why we do things, you know? Um, The lifestyle choices after you make your way out of the neuro rehabilitation unit and after intensive therapy ends. Now it's everyday life, right? And there are so many different everyday life choices that we need to make uh, in, in order to uh, prevent another stroke or if you've never had a stroke, preventing our first stroke. And we know what's really interesting is in that a recent study from last year that uh, in, in younger people, uh, in their 30s and 40s, strokes have a, roughly doubled. And they've actually sort of flatlined in older people. And when I look around and I see younger faces, like my brother, I know that this is true. That teaches us a lesson. And, and we also know in research that there's something called the stroke belt. And, and we look at, at, at this part of the United States where there is just, there's, there's just a lot more strokes occurring there. And what that teaches us is that our everyday lifestyle choices have a, make a huge difference in our risk of stroke, whether that is your second or your third stroke or your first stroke. We also know uh, that there are more female survivors than male survivors now. Uh, we know that there are so many things that we can do to prevent stroke. Uh, and it's, it's the everyday, it's, it's what we choose to eat. When my, uh, my, my father, who passed away a few years, 
Um, he did a he, well, he did a, he did a couple things, but one of the things that he did was he made my brother get on fish oils right away. And back in the day, it was just sort of oh, that's not going to do anything, you know. That's just sort of you know, recovery is three or six months, and that'll be it. Too bad, <laughs> right? Well, that's not true. So we know that omega threes. There are two types of omega threes that your brain uses. So the first is called DHA, and the second is called EPA. It's important for stroke survivors and loved ones to get more omega-3s and less omega-6s. So omega-3s go up and omega-6s go down. So of these two omega-3s, DHA is what I call your think better omega-3. And EPA is what I call your feel better omega-3. How many of you like seafood? Good. <laughs> That's great news. My mom does not eat seafood very much. And as the one of the people who helps run this organization, She's going to start, right, Mom? <laughs> <laughs> seafood is the richest source of the two forms of omega-3s that your brain uses. So as a stroke survivor, you need DHA because it's essentially like Play-Doh, right? So pregnant mothers need DHA because it is the building block of an infant's brain. It's what your brain uses as the Play-Doh to sort of make your brain. So if you're a stroke survivor and there's damage, you definitely need DHA. But guess what? A lot of stroke survivors and loved ones are also uh, struggle with depression. So you also need to feel better. And inflammation is interesting because after, uh, you know, it's sort of a paradoxical effect to where is something good or is something bad? So inflammation is helpful for a short amount of time. So when your brain has an injury like a stroke, the initial inflammation is good, but then you really want to move into what we call an anti-inflammatory state. You want to move away from inflammation. You do not want your brain cells and your neurons to be inflamed. You don't want your body, the cells in your body to be inflamed. Having enough of those omega-3s, the DHA and the EPA, is one of the best ways in which we can move our brain and our body from a pro-inflammatory state to an anti-inflammatory one. Now, there are vegetarian sources of omega-3s. Do I have any vegans or vegetarians here? Not one? Oh, okay, good. <laughs> it, there, there are healthy ways to be a vegetarian uh, um, or a vegan and get those, but it's it's a special case, and you definitely need to take some supplements. Um, but seafood has most seafood has roughly the same amount of D, DHA and EPA, so it has about half and half. So I, I want to talk about a little bit more about diet. Is the diet stuff interesting? Yeah. yeah? Um, so we know in, our, in a recent study published in probably the most prestigious journal, the New England Journal of Medicine. Oh, sorry, I'm going to put this over here. Uh, we know that 30% of strokes and also heart attacks and deaths caused by those diseases can be prevented by following a Mediterranean diet. That's pretty significant, especially if you're a stroke survivor. It's really important to eat the right foods. One of the, uh, if I could sum it up, <laughs> it's eat way less carbs and eat way more fruits and vegetables and fish. Uh, one of the um, researchers that we interviewed as part of this book, she's at a very prestigious um, research center and she is now doing clinical trials that will hopefully be published um, and she is using a low carb diet and seeing the effect that it has on stroke survivors recovery. Um, so 
If you're not eating carbs, what are you going to be eating? One of the best snacks uh, are these nuts, right? So it's interesting because I went to Whole Foods, and even at healthy places like Whole Foods or Trader Joe's, you get this bag of nuts and you read the ingredients and it's some sort of trail mix. You don't want that. <laughs> you don't want these energy mixes that mix nuts with M&Ms or even pretzels or yogurt covered raisins. So now you're taking, you're cutting out the sugar and you're throwing the pretzels and chips away, but now you're getting just as many carbs. So what you do want, and it's, you know, it's even hard to find them at Whole Foods, uh, is you want just plain nuts, right? You, and you want them not cooked in oil. So, you know, you just want plain Brazil nuts, or plain almonds, or uh, walnuts, which I couldn't find, or, or cashews, right? Pretty much any sort of nut that is not cooked in oil. Uh, we know from this New England Journal of Medicine that said that 30% of strokes can be prevented, that people were eating nuts, I think it was every day, let me make sure I'm getting that right. Uh, yep, daily. So this, in this study, they were eating nuts every single day. And what's great about nuts is that they have a lot of healthy fats. And there's this new book, and I haven't read it, but I love the title. And the title is Eat Fat, Get Thin. Isn't that a great title? That sums up why we need to eat more nuts. Because when you eat fat, you feel more full. But they have to be the right kinds of fats, right? We're not talk I'm not telling you to go out and eat Doritos that have a lot of sat, you know, the wrong kinds of fats from soybean oil, which have a lot of the omega-6s that we don't want in the brain that causes this pro-inflammatory state. So they were eating this every day, and the other thing, and I'm gonna yell at my mom for this too, that they ate every day is this, olive oil. So these two things are the fundamentals, along with fish, which I didn't want to bring in because it was too stinky. Uh, these are the fundamentals of this Mediterranean diet that was so helpful in not only preventing strokes, but I will also say in the research that I have done, in creating this state of not only uh, reduced inflammation, it prevents dementia. Stroke survivors are, are at an increased risk of developing dementia later in life, so you really want to do this for your long-term health to not fog your brain, right? My last book was called The Brain Fog Fix, and it was all about looking at the strategies, and it was mostly foods we eat, because it's something we do every day, right? We wake up, we eat, it's noon, we eat, 6 p.m., we eat, right? So we're doing it every single day, and if we're making the wrong choices, uh, it, 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 it's, it, it's really bad for the brain, right? So these are the two things that we're eating every day. Now I want to say something about extra virgin olive oil. You shouldn't cook with it because it's not great, it's not stable at high temperatures. So what I cook with, and it's a little hard to find, you can get it at Target, uh, is plain olive oil, or what's sometimes labeled light olive oil. That's better for cooking if you're going to spray the pan and cook some eggs, you want to use light or plain olive oil, and then you want to use extra virgin olive oil for salads, for cold stuff, right? It's really good for you. So my mom offers to make popcorn and soybean oil. Better than chips, mom, but still a really pro-inflammatory oil. Soybean oil, and I know you think it's healthy, but I, but I read the ingredients in your house. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know what, by the way, that, that's a great point because a lot of foods that are marketed to you as healthy are not, and you really have to be a good consumer. I, I bet most people who get those trail mixes with yogurt covered raisins think they're making a really healthy choice, but there's so many carbs in those, and we know that low carb diets can really do, uh, um, it's what I call a modified Mediterranean diet, so it's eating this Mediterranean diet, but making sure you're cutting out. Uh, you, you can have some carbs, but you really want to limit it. Okay, so the other thing that they were eating in this study, so again, we have extra virgin olive oil, 
and melts every day. Extra virgin olive oil is good for two things. When you look, look for any of you science nerds out there, when you look at the composition of the type of fat, not only, it's good for two reasons. Number one, there are antioxidants in olive oil that are really, really good for you, which is why you don't want to buy this at Costco in like a huge bottle. And it's also why you want to look for bottles that hopefully are not clear. You want bottles that are green or really dark, and then you want to put these in your pantry where it's, there's no sunlight and you want to keep it cool because the sunlight will destroy those antioxidants that are good for you. But the other reason that olive oil is good for you, if you look on the back, it has the highest amount of monounsaturated fat. You don't really need to know this, but for any of you science nerds out there who want to know why olive oil is so good for you, if you look at the composition of the fat, there's monounsaturated, polyunsaturated, saturated, and then trans. So you really want the monounsaturated, and olive oil, out of all oils, has the most monounsaturated fat. So it's really just fantastic for your brain. So the other thing that they were eating is they were eating fish three times a week. They were eating these. So this is a great swap. Oh, sorry, I keep doing that. Um, here's a black bean soup I bought at Whole Foods. So beans are just fantastic. Uh, beans are great because beans are actually, uh, a lot of things we don't think of as carbs, right? When we think of carbs, what do you think of? Uh, pretzels or chips or sugar, flour. Uh, but even when we cut those out of our diet, there are still some really healthy ways to get carbohydrates. So beans are both a protein source, but they also have carbs, but they have the right kind of carbs. They have the kind of carbohydrates that have a lot of fiber that, like those healthy fats, keep you full. Uh, the other thing that they were eating is, and again, this is a little stinky, so I didn't bring it in. Uh, if you do eat meat, they were cutting out red meat uh, and eating white meat. That means if you are going to eat meat, I, while wild salmon is like the A plus choice, if you're going to eat meat, uh, make it grilled chicken. That's like a Let's call that a B minus. Uh, because if you eat that red meat, that hamburger, that's a, probably an F, <laughs> right? So we have different types of proteins and how good they are for you. And, and, and by the way, I, I, I have what I call the 80-20 rule, right? So it's, I'm telling you what you should be doing, and I hope you do it about 80% of the time. And then 20% of the time, you know, for those of my family members who went to lunch and ate pizza, uh, but, but I do hope that it, it is indeed an occasional choice and that hopefully we are eating enough fish. So um, after this lecture, you're going to eat more fish, right? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. That looks like a no. That's probably a no. Or my mom can take some supplements, which I've bought for her many times. But, um, <laughs> so, and the other thing that I hope all of you are doing and what they did in the study is that in this study, they were having at least three servings of fruit and two servings of vegetables. So that just means a lot of these. I just hope you're, whatever it is, I just hope you're eating a lot of these. Tons of fruits, tons of vegetables, all the time. In this study, let's take a survey here. So here's five. So I bought one, two, three, four, five. I have spinach, I have asparagus, Brussels sprouts, avocado, and apples. That's five. I recommend seven. Because in my last book, the research shows that the people who were the happiest and the healthiest with the highest levels of well-being in the whole world were eating not five, but seven. How many of you are eating seven servings of vegetables and whole fruits and by the way, orange juice does not count. I'll tell you why in a second. How many of you are eating, so if you're eating the orange or you're eating the whole apple, that counts. Apple juice, orange juice, they don't count. They're terrible for your blood sugar. How many of you are eating seven servings a day? A day. Two. How many of you like this study, in this study that shows that it does a fantastic job of preventing stroke? How many of you are eating five servings a day? Probably less than half of you, right? 
That's probably one of the simplest and easy. I know it's really hard to find wild salmon. I know it's really hard sometimes. And sometimes, trust me, like I'm on a plane a lot. Sometimes it's like, well, we have ravioli or chicken sandwich. It's like, okay, well, I guess that's what I'm eating because I'm starving. Uh, but eating five servings of fruits and vegetables every day is something that's really easy to do, even if you're downstairs at Denny's. Right? There's, there's always vegetables almost everywhere. There's always whole fruits almost everywhere. Um, and I want to talk about, out of, oh gosh, how did that hour go by so quickly? Um, so we definitely, there's another study I want to talk about that was published, and it looked at how big and beautiful these people's brains were. So if you've had a stroke, you definitely want your brain to get bigger, right? Because if you've had, if you have, if you've had damage, in your brain, you want the brain to get bigger. And it looked at, so we've talked about all of the, all of the uh, choices in the Mediterranean diet, so that's olive oil every day, nuts every day, fish three times a week or more, don't eat red meat, eat white meat instead, five servings of fruits and vegetables every day. Of all of these things that you're gonna be eating, these scientists look at, Oh, and beans, sorry, beans. They looked at, out of all of the choices in the Mediterranean diet, which ones were the most associated with larger brain structures? So they're actually, so we know that, okay, so all of this stuff is good for survivors, and by the way, all of us. It's the diet that I try to follow. Uh, it's, it's the diet that if you've, uh, it prevents brain fog, it prevents all sorts of things. But out of all of the foods of the Mediterranean diet, there were two foods that were the best at actually making the brain bigger. Anyone want to guess what the two were? You got it. Fish. Fish was the, probably the number one thing, which is why we're all going to make my mom eat salmon tonight, right? <laughs> or, you know what? Another one of my favorites is, is shrimp. Studies have found that uh, shrimp. Uh, which is shrimp is at Chinese restaurants, shrimp is at Mexican restaurants, shrimp is at barbecue places. You can put shrimp on basically anything. Shrimp is actually pretty good in terms of having high levels of those omega 3s and fairly low levels of toxins like mercury. Salmon, you want to make sure you buy that wild. Uh, and I do have a, a list uh, in my last book. Um, but you can find it somewhere online. I should have brought those cards. Um, but you can, uh, I'm just going to give you a few here now. So salmon, you do want to make sure it's wild caught because you want high levels of omega-3 and low levels of mercury. But there are some other fish um, that we know from research from Harvard and the EPA that it's okay to buy farm-raised. So my two favorite is um, my favorite probably is rainbow trout. So rainbow trout, uh, when it's farm raised, has very high levels of omega-3s and also very low levels of toxins like mercury. And the other one is arctic char. So here we see arctic char on a menu. That's another one that has very high levels of omega-3s, very low levels of mercury. And, and it's hard, you know, I, I understand, I feel, I, I've often said that it feels like you need a master's degree just to go to the grocery store, because you have to figure out, like, what is it that I actually need to buy? And to be honest, our world is very polluted, so we can't just go out and buy any fish. Some of them are very, very, um, have high levels of mercury because of what's, what's, what's in our world these days. So we just have to be very careful what we're buying. So the second thing that the study, anyone have any guesses? So again, out of all of the aspects of the Mediterranean diet, fish was the number one food associated with larger brain structures. Any guesses on what the second was? Olive oil, vegetables. Olive oil, vegetables. This one surprised me. Beans? Beans. So this, this this is this is good news, and I'll tell you why. <coughs> Wild salmon is very expensive, and sometimes it's kind of fishy if it's not prepared right. Um, it's hard to find good quality fish in a lot of places, but you can find beans everywhere, and they're really really cheap. They're cheaper than grilled chicken. They're cheaper than crap beef. 
right? So, so it's good news. And, and if you if you don't eat fish or you're a vegetarian mom, so this is good news for you. So you just have to eat beans, which you do. So that's good. Um, the other, uh, the other um, little secret that I have, I got this little wellness shot here. If there's one recommendation that will cost you almost nothing, we know that turmeric, does anyone know what turmeric is? Turmeric is that spice, you can buy it, you don't even have to go to Whole Foods, you can get it at Kroger's or you know uh, any, any grocery store. And it's cheap and you don't need very much. So we know that two things. We know, this looks so good, and it kind of tastes bad at first, but then like a lot of things that kind of taste good, right? So this shot is just turmeric and water and lemon. Oh, and, a, and a little pepper. No black pepper? Oh yeah, it's got pepper. That was a really big shot. But I love this taste now. Uh, I used to hate it. Yeah, it's, ooh, that was a strong one. So what kind of lemon was in there? Just a squeeze of lemon. So that's what I do. The squeeze of lemon is optional, but I like the lemon to sort of cut the flavor of the turmeric. So turmeric, if, if you've ever, I'm sure all of you had mustard, turmeric is what makes mustard yellow. But there's not very much turmeric in mustard. Uh, the taste is, uh, there's a lot of turmeric in curry. So Indian food has a lot of turmeric in it. So they found that as it relates to brain fog and dementia prevention, it does three amazing things. And every single person, whether you're a survivor or a loved one, should be having it every single day. First, let's talk about how it prevents brain fog and dementia. So if you've had a stroke, you are at an increased risk of developing dementia. You do not want dementia, Alzheimer's disease, which is a form of dementia. Uh, certainly, uh, it's another one of the most, because it's a disease of the brain, another one of the most devastating diseases, right? Taking away memories, taking away your kids' names, taking away, you know, there's also a lot of other symptoms that people don't know about agitation, anger, confusion, not knowing where you live, getting lost. Um, so they looked at rural India, and they looked at 65-year-olds in India, and they looked at 65-year-olds in America. And they found that they had over 90% less Alzheimer's disease and dementia than our 65-year-olds. So scientists looked at what, what is it about those Indians? Like, are they exercising more? Like, is it that, are they more supportive? And they had this theory that it was because they're eating turmeric every day. Every, almost every single day, most of them. And then they proved it in a different study. They looked at what happened when people had turmeric and black pepper in their bloodstream. And they found that in brain scans, it blocked the accumulation of the plaques that form in your brain and fog your brain. So they thought, wow, that's it. I recommend a wellness shot that'll cost you about a penny to make. It's one half teaspoon of turmeric, a half teaspoon of black pepper, and an ounce or two of water, that's it. So they've also found another thing uh, something, something also interesting. Indians put black pepper in their curry. If you take turmeric and you don't have black pepper, it's digested and it doesn't get absorbed into your bloodstream. Some foods are really well absorbed, some are not. So it basically just goes right through you and your body and your brain don't get any of the good stuff. But if you add black pepper, it increases the bioavailability, which is a really fancy word, meaning that your body actually digests it and it makes its way into your brain. So we know that in my research, I found that I was estimating, I was looking at different traditional Indian curry recipes and I was looking at, okay, how much are Indians eating in a day? And that's about how much, roughly. So if you want to do more than that, be my guest. But I, I would say that this is the minimum every day, a half teaspoon of turmeric and then adding the black pepper. So 
so that your body actually absorbs it. The second thing that it does, in other countries, they have a lot of, um, we use a lot of prescription antidepressants here in this country, and other countries do not. For, I could talk about that for an hour, but I won't, because I'm, I'm already at time, I'm time, and I have so many things I want to still talk about. But um, they found that for mood disorders, and if you're a caregiver, and maybe life is a little bit harder than it used to be, you're probably at an increased risk for depression. And if you're a stroke survivor who is dealing with something, you probably have an increased risk of depression. They found that turmeric was, in other countries, as effective as prescription antidepressants in treating depression. Because we now know, and in terms of why they think that is, there are many compounds in it, but we now think that inflammation is the root cause, one of the major causes of many disorders, including depression. So if this is one of the most potent, along with fish and olive oil and beans, one of the most potent anti-inflammatories that you can put into your body. And I love it because it's so darn cheap and it's so easy to have every day. Um, so it's just, uh, it's just really incredible in, in, in so many ways. <clears throat> and, and then the third thing that it does that is especially relevant to survivors is we know that probably along with these, it's one of the most potent uh, foods for neurogenesis and that we know that it can really help to um, increase the birth of new brain cells. And, you know, I, I'm a big fan of interval training and I go to these really hard classes because I'm kind of lazy, but if you put me in a class and somebody's yelling at me, I can really work out hard, right? Which so Christine, you to that personal trainer, right? So if you need that motivation, that's great. Most of the good supplements that have turmeric, these companies know that, and most of them will have something called bioparin, which is pepper, with it. So if you are getting a supplement, make sure that there is at least, if you're reading the ingredients, something that has a name like that, um, and that will help it to be absorbed. Um, I like fish oil supplements. I think it's really hard to get enough omega-3s. There are a lot of um, cofactors. There, there are things you are gonna get in wild salmon that you're not gonna get in a fish oil. Uh, However, that being said, I think it's really, um, I take a fish oil every day. I think most people should. There is a, there is a, there's a controversy about this and I've asked some of the best neurologists and best nutritionists and physicians and the progressive ones say that there is no risk and that they've never seen an increased risk of bleeding and the conservative ones will say that yes, there is. But there is no expert whether this doctor or nutritionist is um, progressive or conservative that is gonna tell you not to eat fish. They're all gonna tell you to eat fish. So fish would be also the safer version. Um, in general, in terms of mo most strokes, um, not true for all strokes, but for most strokes, you know, for over 80, probably 85% of the strokes, and your blood is actually a good thing. Um, you, you do wanna talk to your doctor about that, but no doctor is gonna tell you not to have fish. I know I'm out of time, so I'm going to talk about one thing. If there is one vitamin that is important for stroke survivors, it's folate, which is a type of B vitamin. Folate, again, like turmeric, has a lot of benefits. Folate, all of some of the experts we interviewed for this book are very conservative, and I'm not. <laughs> they want to see like 20 years of data before they recommend it, but I'm of the of the viewpoint that you people are like me here now and we want answers now, right? That being said, even the conservative experts say there's no data for any supplement for stroke survivors except for folate. We know that folate works. We know that people should be taking folate. In terms of depression, again, like tumor gets a double whammy, drug companies are now putting folate into a prescription form at high doses to treat depression. We know that folate, which is also known as vitamin B9, is what we call a precursor to serotonin, that hormone, that neurotransmitter that makes you happy. 
So if you're getting folate, it helps your body and brain to manufacture serotonin, but it's also incredible for stroke prevention. And also, if you've had a stroke. So what are the forms of folate? Well, funny, you should ask. Because I talked about these five vegetables and fruits you should be having every day, and I brought some of the best sources of folate. Spinach, a great source of folate. Avocados. Makes your pea stink, but asparagus. Brussels sprouts. And then something that you can get at Denny's, if you order like a Cobb salad, hopefully with olive oil, not that disgusting dressing that is full of pro-inflammatory fats. What did I have today for lunch, Mom? Salmon. Salmon. <laughs> and? Vegetables. And vegetables. And I had a, it was a Cobb salad and one of the other great sources of folate, um, romaine lettuce. So pretty much all of these leafy greens, right? So um, I'm out of time. Thank you, LD. Did you learn something? Hopefully something good today. <laughs>